Welcome to Read Your Comics. Today, I'm looking at Magnus Robot Fighter 25 and Rai and the Future Force number 9. Before I get started, let me give a quick shout out to all the subscribers. Really appreciate you guys. And if you're new to the channel, be sure to like and subscribe and leave comments. I like comic discussion and I would love to chat with you guys about these books or or any book that I've covered so far. So this is part of my 1993 exploration. We're going to look at two books today and I'll get into why in just a second. First, let's point out that Magnus 25 was the number 25 selling book of the year. And Rye and the Future Force was the 46th top selling book of the year. Now, I'm kind of combining these two into one video because there was like a big shift in this part of the Valiant Universe. If you're not familiar with the Valiant Universe, um, Magnus, well, Magnus was the first title and it started in the year 4001 AD. And it had just kind of been running that course. And then Rye started as a backup feature, like a flip book to the Magnus book. And then it split off into its own title. And also at this time, there was a shift of the main plot line of this future world of the Valiant universe happening at the same time. The Rye and the Future Force came out first by about, what, May to June, so a month. This was launching a team book, and Valiant did not have a team book at the time. And it was this one was particularly interesting because it was, you know, not only a team book, but it was a future team book. I don't have I thought it had a wraparound cover, but it's just got this fold out gatefold cover. Not much not much on the gatefold, just more robots. So pretty much before this, um in the Magnus world, he was fighting rogue robots, like AI that had kind of come come to life and you know, if they were rogue and dangerous, he was fighting them. But then there was also this philosophical thing where some of them weren't necessarily violent. They'd become independent and like self-aware, but they weren't necessarily violent. So that was kind of an ongoing uh, plot line in the Magnus books. Then this alien robot race came in and invaded. And that happened like a few issues before this. But this was kind of the this was like the shift of like, OK, that alien robot race i think they're called the maleve have kind of taken over the earth and now we're in a battle of like um earth versus uh the salian race um, i should mention before that in the early magnuses too there was like like coruscant and star wars there was like a top level of the planet that was almost like a utopian paradise robots were servants and the blah 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 and then there was the lower levels that was like you know where the working class or poor people lived and the one in the clouds didn't even really <laughs> acknowledge that the ones below existed. And it was, you know, there was a whole like subplot of like class and division and stuff. But now we've kind of erased that because the Molly have come in and basically leveled the upper levels. And now we're just fighting for the earth itself. So take a quick look at Rye first. Now, being from East Tennessee, there was always the debate of whether this was Rye or Ray, because nobody, nobody I knew could ever figure it out. So it is Rye. And I just wanted to point that out, that it's funny that like my teenage self and my friends, we could never decide to come to a consensus. Is it Rye or Ray? <laughs> After the Holocaust. So that's kind of like what I was mentioning about the alien race coming in. So you've got this like dragon robot thing. And now we have, this is actually not even the original Rye. This is a second Rye. So, and, and it's connected to Bloodshot too. And he's like the hero of Japan. So now he's fighting them all leave. This is kind of an action-packed issue, as I recall. This character is skulking around. I don't remember that character's name. But the whole thing is basically Rai going to form kind of like a team or a squad to protect Japan, more or less. You've got the Eternal Warrior, which is kind of cool because his series 
is, was based in the present day, but of course it would always have flashbacks to the past. And it was an interesting concept to think of. I mean, he was kind of like Highlander or something. And it was an interesting concept to think like, here's this guy. He's been around since like the dawn of man. It does take some stakes out of those stories to know that like, okay, he's going to live. He's going to live till the year 4,000 at least. Um, then there was these characters that were geomancers, which there's one in the Eternal Warrior series. And this is the current one for this uh, time period and then we have an exo armor but this is not the exo man of war class but i think they called it the exo uh commander or commando class so it's not quite as powerful as the the exo character in in the title exo man of war so magnus shows up and he's with his girlfriend Leisha, who has like a kind of like a telepathic power with the robots like she could speak to machines and they first she started out as kind of a damsel in distress character but they really built her into um being a lot more uh having a lot more agency and you know her and magnus have friction and stuff and, and as it goes on but magnus is a character i love and i like the tunic outfit on him really i love when he like just smashes through robots the art in this is kind of kind of vanilla. Who even did it? I don't even remember. Um, okay, so John Ostringer did the script. Sean Chen did the penciling. So Sean Chen is a solid penciler. It's kind of vanilla in this. This may have been some of his early work, but it's clear. It's clear what's going on. It's just kind of plain. That's a great panel, though. That's a great panel. And essentially, this whole issue is them just having like a battle. So that's not the geomancer. Okay, so here's this other guy, and I guess he can turn into like a monster. So he turns into, and it looks like a rampaging one. So he's kind of a Hulk in a way. <laughs> this is the Maulive Queen, like the Matrix leader, or the Queen Borg. <laughs> this predates that. Like I said, pretty much this issue is just this big battle. There's that Legia falls out. The Exo Commando girl catches her. I guess of note too is on the cover, Magnus is in his like new armor stuff. In this particular issue, he is still wearing his tunic. And this ray design too is different. The original ray design is pretty much just he was wearing pants and no shirt. And I, this overall thing <laughs> is not the best redesign of a character that was already pretty cool in his own right. He did have kind of like a like a skull cap thing to the previous one. But like I said, this is not the original Rai. Um, that Rai had sacrificed himself and these like nanite things had taken over this one. So he was like a new a new version. And there was questions about his authenticity and if he deserved to be Rai and so forth. Uh, they win the battle, and here's where they have, yeah, you are not Rai. And I think that that was his the original Rai's wife. And here he explains how, you know, the connection to Bloodshot, which is, that was what was kind of cool about Valiant at the time, is, you know, everything had, like, enough connectivity between it. Not so much that you had to read everything that came out, but there was enough, just, like, little threads here and there that it gave that feeling of continuity, kind of like, you know, 80s Marvel did when Jim Shooter was in charge of 80s Marvel. Now, Jim Shooter, I think, was already gone at this point. Let me go back to the beginning one more time. It doesn't mention who the... It doesn't mention who the uh, editor-in-chief was, but I feel like Jim Shooter had just kind of left, you know, within a few months of this coming out. So they have a big debate on whether or not he deserves to be called right. That's a better that's a better outfit than the suspenders he was wearing in the battle. And they agree, and he's going to kind of become the team leader of this Japan squad. And then this series goes off on its own, but this and the Magnus book were pretty interconnected. I mean, Magnus wasn't like a permanent member of this Future Force team, but he was around enough 
to, uh, you know, say that these two books are, are like, these were the two future books. <laughs> Let's just say that. And then, like I said, it did spin out of Magnus itself. There's a Turok ad. Earlier I saw an XO Man at War ad. Zero. So now let's move over to Magnus, number 25. Anniversary issue, so we're going to get a, a silvery cover. I got this one out of a dollar bin, so it's a little scuffed up and, you know, wasn't bagged and boarded. And, you know, it's a pretty, pretty neat cover. This is the debut of Magnus getting a new uh, costume redesign. They get him out of the tunic. I guess they decided that was a little too dated. I always thought it was cool. It fit kind of like the pulpy sci-fi feel of Magnus. This is okay, but you know, to me, Magnus is best like that. This one, John Ostringer doing the writing on this one again. James Brock penciler, Ralph Reese inker. Bob Layton is editor in chief. So yeah, Shooter is 100% gone at this point. Um, and see here we're we're recapping the Ray in the future. Ray, Rye, and the Future Force uh, issue right here. And of course, there's some like weaselly little humans that are, you know, ready to just give up to the robots and help them out because they just, you know, they, they see no hope. The colors of the Valiant books was always pretty impressive. It's like a watercolor, like a wash. And the printing was high quality too. So they weren't using the digital coloring yet. But I always like the, I think the colors always stood out. So I guess that robot thing, that must be their base. The dead dinosaur mecha robot <laughs> lizard thing. And... Now they're recovering from the battle in Japan. Rai and Magnus kind of having a little, not an argument, but just a debate. Man, that's some streaming tears coming down her cheeks there. So she's talking about how she felt all the robots die. Or she, well, all those people that the Maldives controlled. I felt their helplessness and their horror. So I guess maybe beyond just, she's, she's like an empath. But even she'll even do it with the machines and the robots. I guess they had their relationship was still going on because he's like, we're still the same, aren't we? You and I. She's like, I don't know. And she runs off. Magnus goes off with Geomancer. I do like the design of this robot. This took a turn, though. I didn't like the design so much of these robots, but the, the queen was pretty cool. And to me, this was a turn for the, the books that. I didn't love it as it went on. I didn't love it. It was like I was Magnus was one of my favorite books that I was reading period at this time. And uh, this really. Um, this direction change. Hung around. I mean, it was permanent and like, really, you know, you're going to have these robots invade Earth that that's that's pretty much it. Like <laughs> there's, you can't really make it go back to the way it was very easily. Um, then we start getting just Magnus origin reveal, <laughs> watching old, old videos. There's, there's a one, um, that was Magnus's like mentor robot that at the moment he thought was, had been destroyed and a one started out the book looking like that. And then a one took on like a female robot body, like really early on in the Magnus series, but that had seemed to have been destroyed. Um, I think during the initial invasion, but then all of a sudden this bird thing appears and it is a one <laughs> and a one explains kind of how the consciousness there's this, his female robot. Well, her, I guess it's her cause she was, Mentor, it was mentor, but I guess almost motherly too. Um, and as it goes in here, it will explain how that's where they thought it, 
she was dead, but the consciousness was transferred over to this like golden bird. So now Magnus has a, a like a pet sidekick. <laughs> it's almost made for toys. Deathmate coming up. That is a killer ad by Jim Lee, but that falls apart. Um, then we start getting the Magnus origin. So during the Unity um, crossover, we learned that Magnus was the child of from the Harbinger series of Chris, who was a normal person, and this character Torque, who kind of like a mutant or a harbinger as they were calling him. And he had like, you know, he was, he didn't turn into metal like Colossus, but he was kind of a Colossus figure. He was the strong guy, near and vulnerable, kind of a douchebag, misogynist character, um, super macho. And Chris was supposed to be the main character, um, Sting's girlfriend, but they had a thing and he, she ended up getting pregnant with his child and then he died um, before the unity crossover and she had the child during the unity crossover and that's when she met a one and she gave the baby up to a one <laughs> um, and so she basically wrote a letter here on you know who he was and like the, the whole background so now Magnus is learning the story that we as readers had already learned okay it was geomancer that you know, he already kind of felt what Magnus's role was going to be and convinced her to give him up. And yeah, Magnus even holds himself as a baby, not knowing it's him in the moment before the end of the unity. So now he, you know, he's happy actually that he learns that he's human. I guess he didn't, I guess he was having doubts at the time, but now he feels comfortable kind of knowing where he comes from. Because he was raised by a robot. And then we just kind of go, oh, by the way, we've got something for you. Some new clothes. Cool. You got some new armor, even though your skin is hard as steel. And, uh, you know, ready to go. But also, look, my bird form, I can connect to this other, like, humanoid body. And then they get attacked by the small leave again. Got to have some cool action. And it's, it's pulpy sci-fi action still, but it definitely makes a transition to trying to be more like image like at the time. Man, that's a messed up coloring. Um, these future books, it goes from being like sci-fi pulp action of the early Valiant to just trying to keep up with, like I just said, it's trying to keep up with image it's trying to keep up with Marvel at this point and the direction changes and it's so sudden. Um, and the, and then it tapers off so quickly that I would say that's the end of, of Valiant. <laughs> now everything goes on and it lasts for like another, at least four ish years. And before, you know, a claim purchases Valiant and so forth. But this was like a big moment for Valiant, but also it was kind of the beginning of the end. Um, Turok number one was their top selling book of the, of the whole entire line. Uh, this one was pretty close behind it. And, uh, you know, they rode that wave, but then they overdid it with more titles, more titles, trying to make it all connected. Burn, burnout is real. It happens at every level. And I don't know why these publishers don't didn't see that coming and i don't know why even today they struggle with that they you know you can say they abuse their fans and their readership by putting out of just too much stuff um quantity over quality and that was the beauty of early valiant as it was it was quality with just minimum amount of quantity and then they just start cranking it out, cranking it out, cranking it out and didn't have the direction of Jim Shooter. And that's where it just kind of goes off the rails. Although I've heard some of the later stuff, it kind of 
has some good stuff too, but um, the line as a whole faltered going forward. Anyway, this is the turning point for Valiant Comics and the, the future line. Until next time, read your comics. <laughs>